The basic court interpreter's license is a credential issued by the Texas judiciary for somebody who interprets between two spoken languages. This presentation doesn't include American Sign Language or other sign languages. But in Texas courts since 2000, there's been a credentialing system in place in which you take a written test and then an oral test. And if you pass, then you are allowed to appear in court or in other legal settings to interpret between the English speakers and the speakers of other languages. Originally, there was just one level of court interpreter's license. And then several years ago, a second level was created. And the difference is um, that at the basic level, you have gotten at least a 60% on each of the interpreting modes on the oral exam. And you're allowed to interpret in certain lower level courts. Well, at the master level, you've gotten at least a 70% on each of the interpreting modes and you're allowed to interpret in any state court. But today uh, we'll be looking at uh, three topics. Uh, one is with the basic interpreter's license, where can and can't you interpret in Texas? Number two, uh, why do people score in the 60 to 70% range on the oral exam? In other words, um, what is holding people back from making at least 70% and achieving the master credential, which is what everybody is hoping for when they go in to take the oral exam. And number three, if you are in this category and you are a holder of a basic Texas court interpreter's license, what can you do to prepare yourself so next time you take the oral exam, you're able to score at least a 70% and proceed to the higher certification. And I put up pictures of people running races or horses racing and almost reaching the finish line because once you're a basic licensee, you're almost there to your goal of becoming a master licensed court interpreter, but there's just one little uh, obstacle left and that's bringing up your score on the oral exam. And the picture here is of a mosaic which represents uh, the rules that govern court interpreters. And I chose this because um, there are federal laws and state laws and local policies and maybe employer policies that will affect how you use your basic court interpreter's license. And they were created at different times by different people for different purposes, and they're not entirely consistent. And sometimes it's confusing to know what you can do with the basic interpreter's license. So I'll try to summarize by first looking at the applicable state rules and statutes. The most important place to look for a definition of the basic license is in the Texas Government Code, which says, and I'm um, extracting the pertinent sections, a basic designation permits the interpreter to interpret court proceedings in justice courts, of which there are about 803, and municipal courts that are not municipal courts of record, of which there are about 1,001, but not to interpret a proceeding before the court in which the judge is acting as a magistrate. So. This is complicated and takes a while to pull apart, um, but basically the um, court system starts with the lower courts where you go for things like traffic tickets and misdemeanors. And then there's the mid-level where more serious cases are heard that involve more money or people going to jail. And then above that are the appellate courts where judges review the work of the mid and lower level courts. And so the basic license is intended to keep you at the lower level um, justice courts and um, have things like small claims if two individuals are suing each other over a few hundred dollars, thousand dollars that might be heard in a justice court. A municipal court has a lot to do with traffic and zoning violations. Um, and so as a basic interpreter, you're intended to focus your work there as you improve your skills and get to the point that you can test for the master level. There are gray areas, there are different kinds of legal proceedings that are hard to categorize in one of these uh, levels. And um, there are some people who have summarized this statute as saying, if it is a court of record, meaning there's a court reporter typing down everything that everybody says, then a basic interpreter can't interpret there. And that is, that's an oversimplification, but it's a good start. And if you're curious about the term municipal court of record, that means one of these lower level courts with the municipal judge, um, but that is large enough and has the budget and the staffing to have a court reporter who is keeping a written record of the proceedings there. And those are the um, larger municipal courts around the state. There were 184 last time I, I Googled it out of uh, the 1,185 total municipal courts in the state. And here's a list 
of the municipal courts of record in Texas, in other words, the one where a basic license is not enough to interpret. Back when the statute was being crafted, there was an exception carved out for counties with smaller populations that would have a harder time finding licensed court interpreters, which says that if the county has a population of over 50,000 and the languages other than Spanish, which are much harder to come by, um, then the court can make a finding on the record that there is no licensed court interpreter within 75 miles that can interpret in the language necessary in the proceeding and then use an unlicensed interpreter. This was written before the days of Zoom and WebEx and other um, video remote interpreting that we have now. While on the other hand, if the county population is under 50,000, then the judge can in Point a spoken language interpreter that holds no license at all as long as this person meets certain minimum requirements which are really a low bar uh, qualified as an expert according to the Texas rules of evidence which is basically demonstrating the ability to do the job having some expertise experience training at the judge's discretion at least 18 years of age and not a party to a, a proceeding if you are one of the people who's getting divorced then you're not allowed to interpret for the spouse in the divorce hearing, for example. Texas has 254 counties, and here's a quick list of the ones with a population of at least 50,000 as of the last census. So these are all of the urban counties or ones that contain large cities. Moving on from the government code to the code of criminal procedures, we see a much lower bar uh, created at a different time um, saying that anyone can act as the interpreter and that the same rules apply to them as to a witness, even though what we're doing is, is very different from what a witness does. We are often there assisting the witness to bear testimony in a language that will be understood by the court. And this one also mentions that if um, the interpreter doesn't understand what the limited English proficient LEP person is saying, then you can use relay interpreting where there's another interpreter between the witness and the interpreter helping the interpreter understand the dialect or the um, uh, way in which the witness is speaking. The deeper we dig in the statutes, the funnier it gets. The Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code says simply, the court interpreter must be well-versed in and competent to speak the Spanish and English languages. There's only mention of Spanish as if no other languages are spoken in the state. And it only talks about your speaking skills, not your listening skills or your experience in translating and reformulating and cognitive loading and note-taking and everything else that goes into interpreter training. So again, this is a very low bar that anybody with any interpreter's license would easily pass. There's a rule in the Texas Rules of Evidence that says an interpreter must be qualified. What does that mean? It's up to you. And must give an oath or affirmation to make a true translation. And here we see some confusion between concepts of translation and interpretation, but we know what they're trying to say. As of a month or two ago, there were 490 Texas licensed court interpreters. And the, the breakdown on this chart shows that about 13% of those are basic, and there are basic interpreters now for Spanish and a few other languages. The orange group are what we call informally the grandfathered court interpreters who were already acting as court interpreters in 2000 when the statute passed, and there was an exception made for them if they could get a letter of recommendation from a judge saying this person has already worked for me as a Spanish interpreter or as an interpreter in whatever language and does a good job. Those people were not required to take the written and oral test um, that's now part of the system. And so um, this uh, cohort of interpreters is still working around the state. A lot of them have retired and as they retire, um, they'll need to be replaced by people who have passed the exams. And it's uh, an exam produced by the National Center for State Courts that's used by most states around the country. The gray section are those interpreters who have passed the exam at the master level. And so it's roughly 46% currently. And so as time goes by, we'll expect to see the orange group shrink and the blue and the gray group take up more space and the people in the blue group hopefully retesting and making it over to the gray group at the master level. 
So I've put a picture of a plane here um, as an allusion to a pilot's license, the court interpreter's license. It's kind of like a pilot's license in that it authorizes you to act in a certain capacity. And some people have flown planes without having the correct license, but those who have the license are automatically assumed to be able to do the job well. And so with the basic license, you are pre-approved to interpret in any municipal court that isn't in that list of 184 municipal courts of record or any justice court, but not county or district courts. And then two and three, um, these are uh, subject to interpretation and you'll wanna be careful how you proceed to make sure that uh, you um, do not get accused of using your basic license somewhere where it's not allowed. Um, if you are not using your license, but you are appointed by the judge and approved by the attorneys and the parties to interpret um, in another court, there are statutory um, exceptions um, that may apply to you. But anecdotally, anecdotally, I've heard of basic interpreters who were um, fined by the JBCC for interpreting in a court that their basic license would not permit them to, even if last month they were allowed to interpret in that court as an unlicensed interpreter. Once you take the exam and you get your basic license, you're under the jurisdiction of the JBCC and they can sanction you before you take the test and you are just a bilingual person who is asked to interpret, then the JBC has no authority over you and so they can't do anything to you. And so this is sort of a, a you know, let's say a, an area that should be addressed in future legislation cleaned up, um, defining just when and where you can use your basic license and um, what uh, the fact that somebody with a basic license is probably better qualified to interpret than anybody with no license at all. And earning the basic license should not reduce the number of places you're allowed to inter interpret, it should expand them. But this is an evolving field of practice and most people involved are unclear on how the rules apply. Uh, number three, also uh, depositions. Depositions are where you sit often at a law firm with attorneys and a witness and maybe a videographer and a court reporter and you interpret for somebody who was injured in a car accident or at work. And that testimony may later be entered into evidence in a trial. And so in general, most people feel like the rules that apply to the interpreters in the court where the testimony will be used apply to the deposition, which is sort of a, a precursor to the trial. But as far as I have found, it's not spelled out anywhere in the rules or the legislation. And so that's up for debate as well. So the good news is that if you're a basic licensed court interpreter, you are like at least 95% of the way to your destination. You have learned your second language fluently, which is huge, you're bilingual. Uh, number two, you've learned how to interpret. You've probably interpreted in different settings like education, uh, religious services, um, volunteer, nonprofit setting, socially for family members. And you've learned how to uh, work out all those mental puzzles of how to express something in another language when there's no exact equivalent. Uh, you've also learned the legal terminology and court ethics that govern court interpretation about being unbiased and impartial and using your best judgment and making everyone aware of impediments to performance and so forth. You've passed the written exam and half the people who take the written exam don't pass that. The written exam is all in English and it tests you over your English fluency, basically your knowledge of um, high level vocabulary and also legal terminology and some ethics and professional practice. And you have passed the oral exam in all three modes, simultaneous, consecutive and sight, uh, at least a 60% level, maybe much higher. And so now we're on step six, past the oral at the 70% or more level. And then seven is fine work. Once you get that license, like if you become a licensed uh, uh, pilot, you still have to go out and find a plane to fly, find somebody who will hire you uh, to work for an airline or to contract out to different airlines. And you'll be in the same position with your court interpreter's license. But that's a matter for a different webinar. So why do people score in that 60 to 70% range? Good enough to get the basic license, but not the master license. This is all anecdotal. This is from chatting with a lot of people who've taken this test. And 
everybody goes in with high hopes, um, but also stressed out and worried. And when they get the email or the letter back saying, uh, you've passed, that's wonderful, but you passed at the basic level, that's always a disappointment. And um, often uh, people will uh, get frustrated and give up at that point. Others will, will press on and say, I can do it. I was this close. I was just a couple points below. You know, I was fine in two of the modes and in this mode here, I need to focus my studies. So anecdotally, I think people score in this range because they were overconfident in their own skills. Maybe you've done a lot of interpreting in certain situations and you thought the test would be easier than it was. Uh, you thought you were better prepared. Um, inadequate practice with realistic materials. Maybe you studied certain things, but not under conditions that simulated what the exam would be like. Maybe in actual real world interpreting, you work at a law firm, you do court interpreting, legal interpreting all the time, but the way the test is given was unfamiliar and you hadn't practiced that way. And so it was harder than you expected. And then there's all kinds of mental obstacles, uh, being nervous, anxious, uh, not sleeping well the night before, having nightmares, going in tired, um, going in uh, desperate or frustrated, um, that your emotional state will really impact your performance on any test. Or freezing up during the test, if you're going along just fine and then a word comes up and you can't think of how to say it in the other language and you fixate on that while the recording keeps on playing, and you might get behind and miss several words that you knew because you were busy trying to figure out this one that you couldn't remember. And so to get past that point, you just need to train like you're gonna fight. They used to tell us in the Air Force, um, you have to make your practice as similar to the conditions you'll be testing under so that you'll be not only a good interpreter, but a good test taker. How can you score over 70% next time in each of the three modes? These are my top eight tips. Uh, believe you can do it and actively counter doubts and self-criticism. Uh, talk to somebody, talk to a friend, a loved one about uh, your fears, your anxiety, your stress, and admit it and then figure out how you're going to counter that, how you're going to change your attitude, reprogram your brain, and convince yourself that you can do this. And every time a little voice in your head tells you that you're going to fail, you have to uh, uh, attack that and um, speak, preferably out loud, positive uh, goals and um, affirmations that will put your brain in the right state of mind. You can analyze your strengths and weaknesses on the last oral test. Unfortunately, we don't get detailed results that tell us exactly what we missed and how to improve. But after you get out of the oral test, you can um, just reflect on it and think about what was difficult for you and uh, which modes you want to focus on. Um, don't waste time studying a mode that you already do very well. You should be spending 80% of your study time on the modes that you didn't pass and only maybe 20% on the ones that you already have mastered. Get the test on the calendar. In Austin, every quarter, you can take the oral exam. You have to wait six months from the last time you took it. So I would say whenever it's next available, uh, you should be signing up for it now. If you passed at a basic level last time, then probably six months is enough time for you to raise your performance up to the master level. And once it's on the calendar, once you put down that $300, last time I checked, um, just having invested that money is a big motivation. Nobody wants to waste $300. And so I'm um, saying, I'm going to study and study, and then when I feel confident, then I'll spend the money on the test. Uh, you have a lot less motivation to uh, put in the practice you need every day. Number four, commit to a study and practice plan. Uh, put it as a recurring appointment on your calendar. I like doing it first thing in the morning if you have small children before the children wake up and before other obligations can push it out of the way. It's like if you're gonna exercise and you get up a little bit early and exercise before you get dressed and go to work, then it's much more likely to happen than if you say I'm gonna exercise at the end of the day if I have time, if I'm not too tired before I go to bed. That's a recipe for procrastination. So um, make a recurring appointment on your calendar every day or at least five days a week. Find someone to keep you accountable. Ideally, it's somebody else who's studying for the same exam, then you can practice together and share materials. If not, it can be a friend or family member who will just ask you on a regular basis how your preparation is coming 
and maybe they can help you study by quizzing you over a terminology, that kind of thing. Number six, invest in training you can afford. There's lots of free training. You don't have to spend any money other than the cost of the exams and the application to the state judiciary. Um, there are enough free materials on YouTube and different uh, blogs and forums. But if you spend a little money on one of the paid courses, and I'll show you in a minute some options, um, then anything that you can afford again will motivate you and it'll get you access to higher quality materials and if it's a class setting then feedback from the instructor and your classmates and that makes a big difference over just guessing for yourself how well you're doing how close you are to reaching the proficiency level that'll get you a passing grade number seven practice on each mode under realistic conditions read carefully the ncsc publication on the oral exam how many minutes each mode is, how many words, how many words per minute, those kind of details. And then when you're practicing, try to practice under those conditions or more challenging. If it says 120 words a minute, practice 120 words a minute, but also find recordings at 140 or 160 or make your own recordings and push yourself a little bit beyond that so that when you get to the actual test, it won't feel faster or longer um, than you're expecting. And also just practicing in a public place where strangers are looking at you can put enough social pressure on you that it won't feel as awkward when you're at the testing center and the proctor is watching you. Um, that can make us more nervous and make us mess up. And number eight, um, ideally find somebody who will hire you as an interpreter now without your license, like SOCI is, is a contractor for the immigration courts. There are lots of places where you can work as an interpreter without having any court interpreter's license in both legal settings and social and academic settings. And if you are going out on a regular basis interpreting, you're not only becoming a better interpreter, but you're also getting more confident. And that self-confidence will help you pass the test and will help you after you pass to uh, survive the stressful environment of the courtroom. So sorry if you love deer and don't like seeing a the rifle crosshairs on the deer, but um, I was looking for a clip art that uh, was representing accuracy and focus. And so here we are focused uh, directly on our target and not being distracted by anything else. So this is my number one study tip. Whatever mode you're weakest on that you need to bring up, or there may be two, but most of us is just one. Um, focus every day, block out time on your calendar early in the day to do a realistic session, testing session of just that mode using realistic materials and be obsessive about it. Take it as seriously as if your doctor said, you need to get your cholesterol down or your blood pressure down or else you're going to have to go under surgery. You know, convince yourself that this is a daily priority and commit to it aggressively and if you practice that every day, you will see within a month's time that you've made huge progress. And if you have scheduled for the next oral exam, uh, you will do much better on that than if you um, procrastinate or practice ineffectively by uh, not, not uh, working under realistic conditions. This is just a list of different sources of training. Some of these are paid commercial courses, some of them are free and online, but I will copy and paste this down into the comment section or the description section of the video so you can click on them and explore and see which ones would be useful. There are many others as well. And these last couple slides are just a little bit of encouragement. They are recent postings for court interpreters here. As of last month in Austin, there was a position open with the civil courts paying between 58 and almost $73,000 a year, plus benefits uh, for an in-house interpreter. And this is somebody who's going to be sitting in an office downtown and interpreting um, sometimes several hours in the course of a day, but often just a hearing there and a hearing here and a hearing there. And it's a, it's a good job. Um, it's a um, very comfortable place to work and it pays well. And you're also constantly learning new things as you're interpreting different types of cases and you have time to uh, read and uh, explore uh, the profession uh, in between cases. 
And here's one in Laredo. I'm in Laredo right now on assignment, and the federal courts are hiring a, con a, a staff interpreter at 68000 to almost $150,000 a year, depending on qualifications and experience. Now, you can't do this with a Texas uh, master court interpreter's license. You need to pass a federal test, but that's the next logical step on the uh, career ladder the federal exam. It's available just for Spanish now, and it is uh, produced by the NCSC like the state exam, and it's a pretty similar format. It's just you have to um, get a higher score, and it's faster and deals with some different topics because it's in the federal system. Um, but if you pass the basic level and then you do the master level next, in a few years, I encourage you to come back around and start preparing for the federal exam because with the federal credential, you can continue working in the state courts, but you can also interpret all over the country and um, it uh, will open up many more doors of opportunity.